Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Bayless, and I am the publisher of the Huffington Post, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this session at Ad Tech San Francisco, um, where we will talk about tablets, um, an issue that's, uh, I think, front and center for so many of us. Um, so I, just to give a little bit of um, a format for our session, we're going to start out with a quick presentation that I'll give you from uh, a publisher's perspective on some of the iPad initiatives that we've uh, um, created uh, and launched in the marketplace and some of the consumer insights that come from that. Um, Andrew Solmson, uh, who is the managing director um, uh, for the West Coast of Possible Worldwide, will then come up here and uh, he leads the West Coast client teams and has uh, he leads best practices for engagement management and he'll offer great perspective on innovation and uh, where this space has come from and where it's headed next from an experience standpoint. And then for the question that we've all come, from, uh, come to hear, uh, um, because this is ad tech and it has the word ad in it, uh, you know, we are all obviously very focused not only on creating the next generation of experiences, but the next generation of business models for tablets. And there's no better person poised to address that issue than Beth Doyle um, of Viviki, uh, who's an innovations director uh, overseeing uh, operations for Viviki's The Pool, which is an incredibly collaborative uh, research effort um, across the industry to develop these next generations of, uh, of business models as the space continues to be transformed. So I hope you'll find it informative. Once we go through those three sessions that should be um, uh, about a quarter of an hour each, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end so we can have a meaningful discussion. Um, so uh, just to lead off with the Huffington Post, um, I hope you're all using it every day, all day. Um, but uh, just in case you're not, we're a cross-platform global media brand. Uh, we're proudly a part of AOL. And um, if you look at us from a, uh, from a media perspective, we are a global cross-platform media entity reaching 71 million consumers worldwide. Um, a Pulitzer Prize-winning newsroom that is very uniquely connecting um, award-winning content and conversation. So um, as we shift to this conversation around tablets, I can throw so many big numbers up on the screen. I think we've all seen them uh, in terms of the growth of, of the tablet space. Um, if there were 90 million tablets in people's hands by the end of 2012, uh, that's estimated to be nearly double by the end of 2017. And from an advertising perspective, there's, I think, a very big gap if you look at those same dates. The multiple's very different. So where this is, I think, really parallels what we see in so many technology spaces, which is that the business model traditionally lags the consumer behavior. So consumers lead us, we create experiences, and then the business model follows. And I think this is no exception. Um, in our own experience uh, at the Huffington Post, we've explored uh, quite a few different ex uh, uh, incarnations of a tablet experience. In January of this year, we actually launched on Flipboard, which I'll share a little bit about. We've launched a number uh, of very important iPad applications. We had one that was enormously popular at the end of last year, which we relaunched at the beginning of this year, which was our core iPad app. Um, we also have an iPad expression for HuffPost Live, which is um, our video experience. And then uh, we have just launched a new Android app and shortly coming a new iPhone app. So we are living and breathing the reality, which is that as creators of content, we must think seamlessly across these devices, across these platforms. And in many cases, I think it's worth noting that it requires a tremendous commitment to development. These apps um, you know, do not create themselves. Uh, and, and it requires, in, in each of these cases, a custom development process for that platform, for that form factor which I think is uh, something to think about uh, in, in this space um, as we continue the conversation, um, which I'll get to in just a moment. So I'm going to take you through three of our key tablet experiences just very briefly to share some consumer insights and a bit about our experience as a brand at the Huffington Post. So it starts with our iPad app, which we just relaunched in February of this year, put it into the Apple Store. If you look on the left, we had an enormously popular uh, experience um, that was very beloved. In fact, I would often walk into conference rooms in my role and, uh, and folks would share with me that they started there down that iPad app. 
And yet when we looked at it from a visual standpoint, when we looked at the design aesthetic, when we looked at the opportunity to really lean into uh, the native experience to this device, we felt we had really barely scratched the surface. And so you can see a much more visually arresting design on the right-hand side. Uh, using tiles and visuals and a much more rich set of imagery to really engage consumers and bring them into the experience. Some of the highlights I would share about our, our relaunch, first of all, which you probably can barely see on the screen is, it has a select your edition at the bottom. Because as I mentioned before, we have 71 million consumers globally. We've taken the HuffPost platform and we've brought it around the world. We're partnered with Le Monde in France to create Le Huffington Post. We've partnered with El Pais in Spain to create El Huffington Post. You get the idea. Anybody want to guess the next five <laughs> names? Um, so, uh, so the beauty was that this was an opportunity not just to innovate in the United States, but to bring a technology and platform that could be used around the world. But we could marry that technology, which we pioneered here in the US, and marry that to the brilliant uh, and native and authentic perspectives that could be brought by those respective organizations that were living and breathing the culture, the news, and the information in each of those places. Um, and so this uh, is one of the first consumer-facing expressions of that full experience coming together. So as someone logs on, they can choose the country. The other thing is, um, you know, I think the design was far more intuitive. Um, we were able to use more of the swiping behavior that obviously is so inherent uh, in, in this space. Um, uh, and we, you know, from a comment standpoint, we're able to surface comments in a far more visually interesting way. So the same uniquely social characteristics that we had on our website could translate to innovative experiences on the tablet. If we uh, look at some of the dynamics, I find uh, some of this really interesting. If we look first of all at time frames, so the peak moments for usage on our iPad app are eight in the morning and nine p.m. Now. Some of, for some of you, that would come as a surprise. For some of you, it wouldn't. For me, it was certainly not a surprise, because when you look at our desktop usage, it's an at-work experience. We see that our usage on the Huffington Post core site peaks between 9 and 5, where that enormous, giant, sucking sound on uh, US productivity, um, which is everyone uh, looking at the Huffington Post at their desks. Um, you heard it here first. Um, so um, it's no surprise that people were really extending their interaction with the brand and using the tablet as an opportunity to check in with that information before they were heading into work and to engage with it deeply um, uh, in the evenings. The session length really varies. It can be between uh, 3 and 10 minutes. We've had over 1.4 million total downloads. And I'll get back to the challenge of downloads in just a moment. Um, and we're exceeding the, uh, the weekly session benchmarks for the news category um, quite substantially with 3.2 median weekly sessions versus a, a benchmark in the industry of 1.7. So it just gives you a little bit of a sense of some of our experience there. One of the things from an advertising perspective that was very important to us as we uh, thought about changing the behavior and literally the motion on the screen was to think about the advertising a bit differently. And I'll be the first to say that as an industry, we have not cracked the code, not until Beth takes the stage. And we look forward to you cracking the code. But one of the things that we wanted to look at is that so much of our industry on the desktop side is obviously page view ad impression, page view ad impression. And when we were starting to look at the early incarnations that the technology team brought to the uh, business side of the house, and as we looked at these, the ads were frankly just scrolling too quickly. How could anyone engage with any of the messaging on the page? So one of the first things that we did was literally pin the ad on the screen to think about in-view advertising and to look at a time-based mechanism for when we were refreshing the advertising as opposed to a consumer motion. Because in this case, the consumer motion was so fluid that it really disrupted the, the, the notions that we traditionally have around ad impressions and how they relate to page views. Totally different experience, shifting gears. HuffPost Live. So here we see the tablet from a different perspective uh, within our brand. In August of last year, we launched HuffPost Live, a live streaming video experience. We built studios in New York and Los Angeles. We're programming 12 hours of continuous content from those studios each and every day. It broadcasts again overnight. We call that live again. And then on the weekends, we generally do highlights. What's truly remarkable about this experience was when we constructed it, it had a very mobile first perspective. It also had a unique perspective on the relationship between consumption and engagement. So on the desktop, on the tablet, across all platforms, the idea was that you might be watching on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, you were participating in an experience that was engaging. You could either comment or uh, read the comments. You could join the segment, literally join us in our green room, and our, and our producers could put you onto the screen. 
So if we think about the traditional view of how a linear news experience might look with an incredibly expert host talking to an incredibly expert talking head or pundit, many of whom we've seen on all the other networks before, and then perhaps at the end of the news segment before they break away to the commercial, they read the obligatory tweet and it's social. Don't tell the networks I said that. Um, I watch them all as well. Um, but you know, the, the fact is that we've challenged ourselves in this nonlinear environment to think differently about what the experience could be, about what happens when you don't talk at your consumer, but you talk with them. And the experience has been phenomenal in terms of the results. We have 51 million video views per month. Again, remember we just launched in August 14.3 million unique visitors and over 22 minutes spent in the session. And if we look at the over-the-top platform, it's actually over 59 minutes of engagement. So really some extraordinary results that come from thinking about participation. And I literally call that, you know, if we think about the generation that comes after Gen Y, we haven't named them yet, I think of this generation as the participation generation. They have a different expectation for what media will deliver them. So of course, we wanted to translate this vision into the tablet space. So the first thing I would note was that when we built it, it was the first of the Huffington Post products that really embraced a mobile web perspective out of the gate. So when you look at the two screens, even before we had launched an app, it had a comparable experience. And in fact, long before we, had, uh, we debuted in the Apple Store, we felt we were delivering a very high quality experience because inherently when we had created the experience, it was meant to fit on this form factor of a tablet. And it worked seamlessly from the moment we launched on that. But there were things that we wanted to do that were unique to applications, some of which are quite fun. So for example, when you're in our app, you can actually use the functionality of Apple TV and swipe that watching part or consumption part to that big 10-foot UI in your living room so I can watch the host talking with the guests and all the, all the audience members. We've had over 7,000 audience members join us on the screen via Google Hangouts. You could watch that on your screen, and suddenly your tablet then became the engagement factor. So we're splitting that screen. Now, of course, this is something we could only do in an app, and it was a wonderful opportunity for us to really explore the full creative potential of, uh, of this experience. When you looked at the way, look at the way that we surfaced our comments and our experience there, there too, there was an opportunity to challenge the notions of design and experience um, to be more creative, to not simply look at a list of comments, which is so often the way we are presented with those kinds of experiences. Here too, we could challenge the nature of linear thinking. And of course, one of the opportunities for us was to translate the advertising model that we had during the actual broadcast, during the actual stream, where we take no pre, mid, or post role and to translate the integrated model that we have on the screen onto this experience. So our model is actually to create these very branded experiences. In this case, you're looking at a segment of features called Tech Game Changers powered by Verizon. And that experience flowed seamlessly from the desktop to all of the mobile and tablet experiences. And in fact, on that tablet in our app, you could navigate in the application to an archive of all of those technology game changer segments, which really spoke to, uh, uh, beautifully to Verizon's positioning in the marketplace. So one, a, a third perspective that I would offer just um, to set the stage is our Flipboard experience. When we were launching this past January, Flipboard forecasted for us that they thought we'd have about a half million users out of the gate. Then 30 days, we were at 1.2. Uh, we had 1.6 by uh, the end of February 2013. We're growing at 34% month over month. We far exceeded any expectations that we had. It's generating a tremendous volume of flips, which is probably a close proxy for page views. Um, and we think this is uh, an incredible example, I think, of a different model, which is not creating it ourselves, but leaning into the innovation of others in the industry who have created a very powerful distribution platform that truly connects with the quality of our content and our uniquely perspective on how to use content and connect it to conversation. Of course, from an advertising standpoint, Flipboard really embraces uh, some of the best and most iconic moments actually from a print uh, moment. You know, the gorgeous glossy ad has now been translated to fully immersive, spectacular creative, and uh, we're really delighted that our average click-throughs on, uh, on our ads exceed the averages and are at the very high end of the spectrum uh, that Flipboard experiences across publishers. So yet another example, dipping our toe in the water in a very substantial way, looking at it through the lens of uh, our core application for the Huffington Post, HuffPost Live, our video experience, and Flipboard, all of which are, are obviously wonderful tablet experiences. So as we, as we shift the conversation to Andrew and Beth, I just wanted to tee up a couple of just thoughts 
um, because uh, this is as much a conversation and exploration of the future as it is. Uh, I want to talk with you and not talk at you as well. So a, a couple of ideas. So the first is, if you look at the Huffington Post and you look at what's made us successful, a huge part of it has been capitalizing on what I call organic traffic. People who are coming from search, people who are coming from social, who discover that content, therefore are leaning into that content, and then the action that they take on the other side of it, when they choose to take a social action, to like, comment, tweet, share, pin that content. For us, this is an incredibly valuable dynamic. It's a virtuous cycle, I often call it the social flywheel, where people are coming in through social, people are taking action through social. For us, in any given month, we have over 81 million social actions on the site. And in any given day, that translates to a really powerful engine of traffic. Two million daily referrals from Facebook, 800,000 coming in from Twitter. The interesting dynamic is if you can capitalize on that social flywheel, those consumers are more valuable. More valuable in terms of engagement. They, of all the referral segments, they stay longer, and they actually spend more at retail. So we know this is a dynamic that's important, but I'll ask the question, in an app we can't do this. So are apps the right way to capitalize on that kind of interaction? between huge platforms for discovery and interaction like social and search? Or are we too disconnected when we start to look at apps um, from these kinds of behaviors? The second uh, thought I would say, I, I would share with you is in my role as a marketer leading consumer marketing for the brand, I have to tell you it's a pretty tough funnel. So let's say we all invest in apps. I've got to get someone to uh, say, I heard about that app. Then they have to download the app. Then they have to try the app. And then they have to decide that they like it enough that it becomes a habitual behavior. That's an incredibly rough conversion cycle. It's a, you know, it's a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of a percentage. So again, just food for thought as we think about apps versus mobile web and some of the things that are enabled by the next generation of technology. And then the last is, how are we going to create a market? Because there's no question that there are publishers uh, probably staying up very late at night I'm fortunate to, to be able to sleep a little bit further into the night because only 20% of our consumption actually comes from mobile as a brand. So I have, a, I have the luxury of a little bit more time to actually think about this as a publisher. But most publishers are waking up in a, at a moment where their consumption has shifted very substantially over to the phone and the tablet world. And for, for many of them, because the business model has not been realized, their, their own business models across all of their revenue streams are really genuinely challenged. So the question becomes, what is it really going to take? And I'll keep looking at Beth. You've got all the answers, right? Um, uh, what is it going to take until we can create a meaningful marketplace that capitalizes on this incredible surge in consumer behavior to move to these devices, the growth we started with, um, so that we can create a marketplace? So um, hopefully that tees things up. I'm going to invite Andrew up to the stage um, from Possible, where, and he will uh, be offering his perspective. Thank you. All right, let's get us started here. Do a quick laptop switch, and we should be in business. Just need the cursor, please. There you are. Okay. All right. So, I mean, thanks, Janet. It's just, you know, it's fantastic work. And you start to get a sense when you look at those kind of numbers and what Huffington Post is doing. We're no longer talking about you know, whether the tablet has arrived. Right? It's here. When two years ago, I was the marketing master the first time there was a tablet track at AdTech. And at that time, we were trying to figure out how real is this? The sales are looking pretty good. Android's starting to get into the market. And we're way past that now. And as also as Janet kind of alluded to, when we talk about the tablet, for a long time, we just talked about the iPad. And certainly from a sales perspective, that's really what we're looking at. But now if you look at the difference between, say, a, a Mac, uh, an iPad mini and a, um, and a Galaxy, right? We're not talking about a huge amount of difference, right? And, and you know, there's, for those who like made up words, right? Fablet is the new favorite word that people like to talk about. I think it's terrible, but uh, it kind of makes the point that there's a real middle ground where we're, we're really discussing uh, mobile devices and the sizing is changing rapidly. And I don't want to prognosticate on what's the right size and what's it going to be. I want to kind of talk about, you know, where, where have we gotten to, right? So now we know this is a real thing. It's established. So what matters today? What are the key points that we want to focus on? 
and where are we seeing some interesting, and I've, I've been asked to share some kind of innovative experiences for things that tablets are doing that are kind of get us, getting, getting us ready for the next stage. So these are kind of the, the four areas where I want to hit, and, um, and the, the first one I want to talk a little bit about collective intelligence. Um, so because we have mobile devices with us all the time, we have an opportunity as brands within companies all over to really start to pull together a lot of information. And I'll tell you, you know, for us, we're a, we're a digital agency, right? We're a 1,500 person agency, and we've got offices all around the world. And when we talk about the things that we do well and the things that we care about, those wouldn't work if it was just one office doing it or one office over here doing it. And that's the way companies, most companies work. An office is kind of where things happen, but you don't really get to pull them together. Because I'll tell you, Technology has changed a lot for us in the workplace, but I'll tell you what it hasn't changed, and when I look at kind of like where our people are, it hasn't changed the fact that time zones are a bitch, right? Dealing with time zones are never easy. There is no amount of software that makes it easy. So what do you do to try to knit people together? Well, what we do is the first day people come in, we give them an iPad, and what's loaded on it is an app that we have, it's called Colab. I want to talk about this because I think it's, 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 it's exactly what people need to be doing for starting to bring groups together and getting ideas that get kind of shaped and formed. So what we do with it is we know where everybody in the agency is at any given time. You can opt out if you're somewhere you shouldn't be. Um, we, uh, we post things large and small, but what we do more than anything else is it's how we get ideas for our clients. So we'll put a client ID out and say, we're trying to figure out what we should do for this client for that uh, you know, campaign or, or, or project and we start to pull together people from all over the world. And this is something that the tablet does so well because it's at hand, you're able to quickly grab it, contribute to something, and then kind of go about your day. And so I think we're gonna to start to see a lot of this kind of collective intelligence where how do you, you know, we see some of it with, with crowdsourcing, how do you start to bring other people into the conversation and get them to contribute to ideas? Because that's really where you get the leverage of scale. Um, it's, you know, it's something that's been a huge piece for us where, you know, we, it takes a while, right? When you're, you know, within your company, nobody thinks that their intranet is any good, right? It's like this place that you go and find out your vacation days. And so for us, we, you know, we had to, you know, really try to push people to do it. We send out emails saying, you know, what were the most popular posts? And we started to get a lot of press on it. But watch for every company that's serious and global to start doing collective intelligence and look for mobile to be the place where that happens. And you know, one of the other kind of pieces about this panel as we started looking at the description was mobile devices are starting to overtake PCs, right? Tablets are gonna outsell PCs in, you know, Mary Meeker says next year, and she's seldom wrong. And why is that? Well, I, I really would make the, uh, make the point that mobile devices are better. And you, know, you heard Janet talk about mobile first, and that's what everything needs to be thought about as, right? You have to design for mobile first. And there are a lot of reasons mobile's better, but let's just kind of take a look at some of the ones that are the best. Everybody's been in the experience of building something, making a website, making a, an app, and everybody's got their things they want to get in it. Oh, it has to have this, it has to have that. You know, how many times have you heard, this has to be on the homepage, right? Well, when you've got a smaller amount of real estate, it cuts that down, it cuts to that conversation. If you do that first and you decide what goes on the smaller amount of real estate, well, now your prioritization's done, right? You know. So when you move it to other platforms, you know what the most important things are. And having things that are purpose built, right, whether it's apps or on the mobile web, they do specific things well. Think about this idea of like discoverability. There's no app store for websites. There's no one website you go to where it tells you all the websites in the world and people rate them and are like, this is a five-star website, this website's terrible. And here are my comments on it, right? It's kind of an amazing thing, it's really special. So you, know, you see all this stuff, and just to kind of drill in on a couple of them, um, you know, the idea of capabilities, almost you know, very few desktop computers do these things very well. Right? They don't have these kind of items. The ability to know so much about how someone's interacting and not just a hardware thing, but how you interact with them, right? This sort of natural interaction. Right? That's what makes people want to use a tablet. And you've seen it a million times, and you give a two-year-old a tablet, and they just start using it. 
Right? When we started doing digital out of home stuff in public spaces, before the iPad, people were afraid to touch it. Right? They, would, they would not want to go up and start touching an interactive like digital you know, wall or billboard or something. And now I see people go up to things that aren't interactive all the time in airports and start like tapping and being like, this thing sucks, it doesn't work, right? That's kind of the way our mindset is really changing and that's all because of the tablet. So what we're seeing a lot of is this kind of big bridge between physical and digital. And the tablet's a really, really great way to do that. So um, I'm gonna show a couple of examples of um, things that I think are, are kind of interesting and innovative ways that now we are starting to see the tablet and the digital properties that sit on tablets start to interact with us in the physical world. And so the first one I want to show is, um, is around the idea of in a public space where you can start to send a synced signal out to the tablet. This is some software that we're developing for things like in arenas, in concerts, and also in advertising. You know, yesterday when, uh, when Tim Armstrong was talking, he talked about kind of live advertising that is content driven. So think about when you're in a space like a conference, any kind of an event with other people, how you can start to take these audio signals, and this is just a quick demo, of, and, and what that can do when you put them all together. So you can send a signal out, inaudible signal, and it can change. If anybody who's got the app running, it can change what they're seeing. It means you can make a mosaic in a room. It means you can put particular ads of particular people. Think about this in a concert, right, where Taylor Swift stands up and says, okay, everybody hold up the app, right? And then you can start to do the modern day equivalent of the wave, where you get to, we know where they are in the stadium, and you can move things back and forth. You can put up messaging, and all of it where you kind of have the individual contributing to a group in the whole. So take that on a much more personal level and take it at a much, much different demographic. And uh, I want to introduce um, Roboto and Yet Yet. So this is uh, this little guy who is uh, cuddly and fluffy, and he's also an iPad case. And so uh, you know, here's the app running, and you pop it in. And because he's in a you know, an aware device, He's a little guy, and you can, you can play with his eyes, and you can comb his hair, and you can uh, you know, talk to him, and he'll talk back to you. Talk to him, and he'll talk back to you. Um, and have all of this kind of fun stuff where he'll sing your toddler lullaby. And it's, this, uh, it's a case that you can't, coming to you, um, you, you can't, can't hurt the iPad because it's totally solid. You can pass it around, you can check it out. But it's this idea of saying, how do you take something that's a totally digital piece and how do you turn it into a physical object? How do you turn it into something? You can pass it around if you want. Um, you know, how, do you, how do you turn it into something that people can play with, that, where the digital piece starts to become a, uh, a real physical object, but it's better, it's connected, and it's a little more different than physical objects. So it's a lot of, lot of, lot of fun stuff coming. I think this is going to be a big area where we're going to see you know, mobile devices as the way to interact in a public space with a physical device, right? That bridge is starting to happen more and more and more. It's fun stuff. Uh, we, we sell them. Um, uh, Totoyacreatures.com. Um, okay, and then the last piece I want to talk about is the idea of, um, I'm going to talk about kind of content, commerce, and testing. Because you know, there's a, there's a real question about how are we going to make money from this stuff? And one of the challenges that is really, really hitting on the app side and something that's going to drive us towards mobile web, I think, more and more, is the piracy that we're seeing on iOS. So piracy on Android has been rampant for a long time. But on iOS, this has just kind of started in the last couple months. We're talking about piracy without jailbreaking. So I want to give a, a, a really sobering example. This is um, 
we released a, a, a really popular game for a client um, a few months back. And after uh, two days, we had uh, 30,008 uniques in China. Would you like to guess how many of those were paid? Turns out there are 39 suckers in China who actually paid for it. These are non-jailbroken devices. Now, this is the kind of thing that it's not happening as much in the US yet, but boy, is it coming. And it's something everybody has to be thinking about. When you're imagining the idea of a paid app, you've got to know that very soon people are going to be able to get it for free. And I'm sure those, ho those holes will be plugged, and I'm sure that those plugs will be gotten around. It's a really, really important piece. So that's going to drive a lot more freemium, a lot more IAP, and we're going to see much more of a move towards the mobile web because you know, now you've got the challenge of an app, and then you can't even charge for it. right? It starts to get really, really tricky. Because you know, we as a group, as consumers, we are incredibly impatient. And that means anything that you've got out there has got to be tested and changed and tested and changed and tested and changed. And I would love to you know, hear from Janet on that and you know, with, with the apps that you've had such great success on, right? How much have you tested? This is, a, you know, when you think about games, attention span is short on the web, right? We know this. It's a lot shorter with apps. It's even shorter with games. And it's even shorter with pay games. And I'll give, give you a great example. This is an app um, that we did last year. It became the number four app in the app store. It's called The End. It's an endless runner. It's a lot of fun. Unfortunately, we started finding out after the first week that there was this massive drop off where suddenly everybody was dying on the third level at the very beginning. It was too hard. And so we were just seeing people stop playing. And finding that sweet spot, right? whatever it is, whether it's how many videos you show on a page, or how hard a game is, or how much interaction you have, and how many people come in, how many times you get hit up for in-app purchases, that line is different for every game. And you know, if you talk to the people at PopCap, you talk to anybody who's, who's serious about games, you test until it works. And that's a big change for a lot of product owners you know, in the physical world. Because a lot of brands are used to saying, like, oh, we tried to launch a brand, we tried the cereal, oh, people didn't like it, OK, great. Kill it. Throw it off to the side. It's not the way with digital products. We iterate, we tweak, until we get it right. So it's a great lesson to take away. All right, now let's, uh, let, let's turn it over and figure out how, how we're going to make money on all this stuff. I think you've, got, I think you've had enough, enough build up. Let's uh, bring it in. Thank you so much. out of this one, right? You guys can hear me okay? All right, so thank you guys so much for inviting me here. My name is Beth Doyle. I work at VivaKey. And um, does anybody here know what VivaKey is? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, so for those of you who didn't raise your hand, VivaKey is um, basically the research and product innovation hub within the publicist family of advertising agencies. So that's like Starcom MediaVest Group, Zenith After Media, Digitas, Razorfish, Leo Burnett, all those guys. So VivaKey doesn't have clients. We basically focus on the future and try and find solutions and new business models. And here today, we're talking about the tablet lane of the pool. And I'll go into um, a lot of detail about that. And again, this is 14 months of research condensed into 15 minutes. So um, it's going to be very top level. But know that everything is public. Everything is avail available for download. I'll put the link at the end of the presentation. So you guys um, don't have to take a lot of notes. You can just listen, because everything I say is going to be available um, on an, a website for that. So first, I want to know who waited in line on April 3rd, 2010, to get one of the first iPads? Anybody in this room? Be proud? No? 
Okay, who has a tablet now? Exactly. So we know that there's unprecedented consumer adoption. And what we wanted to do was look at this compared to other innovations out there. So we looked at the percent of U.S. households by year since launch for different innovations. So starting off with the car, the cell phone, microwave, the fridge, PC, VCR, internet, cable TV, radio, regular TV, and now look at the tablet. When you put in perspective like this, it is crazy. We have never seen anything like this before. It's changed the way we work. I mean, no one's lugging around a laptop anymore. It's everybody's bringing their tablet everywhere. How we entertain ourselves. I hear first class passengers are getting iPads when they walk on the plane. How we read, even how we parent. I have yet to potty train a child, but I've heard this is a lifesaver. <laughs> you saw this at CES this year. <laughs> And even how we learn, I mean, I know a lot of high schools are giving iPads to their freshmen on their first day, and we love this photo because it shows how the tablet has come totally full circle. It really is everything all in one device, and it's something you didn't even know you needed. It's kind of like magic. So the question is, how do we harness this magic and engage with people on this new platform? And how are businesses and marketers going to keep up? We really need to see this as an opportunity, not a threat, and we need to build the road together. And this is where the pool comes in. The pool is an idea based on collaboration, consumer insights, and accelerated activation. And we use a lot of swimming analogies. I'm technically a lifeguard. Um, but it's the pool as in sharing, pooling of ideas. And it's based on that insight that the more we share, the faster we can learn and keep up with changes in consumer behavior. So our mission is to create industry alignment on advertising solutions through the process of pooling resources and uncovering of human insights. So if we break that down, what we do is we figure out what are we going to solve for. It could be ad models, metrics, whatever the industry needs solving for. We gather the stakeholders in a room, and then we conduct robust research to have everything led by those consumer insights. And we align on a solution or num a number of solutions that can truly accelerate the industry. We uh, started in 2008, so we've done 14 different lanes, that's our word for study, in seven countries. We've studied a lot of online video. Um, we uh, have a team in the Middle East who studied display. France has studied IPTV. China studied um, cross-media metrics. But here in the U.S., um, in November of 2011, we started a journey to find what is that best way to advertise on a tablet. So we invited the industry to join us. 13 publishers and 13 advertisers signed up. It's our biggest study to date. We had some great blue chip client and partners such as Coca-Cola, P&G, Best Buy, Walmart, ABC, Yahoo, General Mills, and more. And the process went as follows. It started off with a kickoff, a kickoff meeting. We said, bring your ideas. What is that best way to advertise on a tablet? It could be something that has uh, been in the market since you launched your app or site or something that could be written on the back of a napkin that your developer just came up with. Let's evaluate those ideas. We got 37 in that first kickoff meeting. Evaluate them from business and consumer considerations. We wanted to make sure it was something that, was that we could monetize, something that could scale, and something that we know the consumer would like. And we evaluated those and voted. Each company, each participating company gets a vote. It doesn't matter if you're a startup or if you're Google. It's one vote per company. And we narrowed down those ideas to six. Those six were built uh, built-in beta sites and, and apps. We tested both in-app, in-browser, as well as Android and iOS. And um, we tested them qualitatively with focus groups, came back together as a group, reviewed the results, um, voted again, narrowed it down to three. Those three were then built again, improved upon, and tested quantitatively with panels. And then um, came back together, reviewed those results, voted again, realized those three should continue on to a live in-market field trial with real advertiser dollars. Throughout that entire process, we tested these new ideas um, against benchmarks, which were the models that are currently in market. And then we had a final meeting, reviewed all the results, deemed these models as winners, went on a road show, um, presented this 23 times across the entire Publicis family in nine cities to build demand, and um, then did an industry release, which just happened on the three-year anniversary of the iPad last week on April 3rd. So as I said, 14 months of research, 37 different ideas considered, 
130 different executions tested throughout those three phases, 831,000 hours with 20 million consumers, we reached a third of the entire tablet market. It's safe to say we think we're the biggest tablet study out there right now. So what did we learn? So basic consumer feedback, um, a lot of this is intuitive, but it's great to have the consumer results behind it, is, you know, let me drive. The tablet is a really intimate device. This power of touch is affecting um, content and advertising like nothing before. We need to make sure we are offering choice and control and nothing is forced. Uh, more for me, the consumers want to interact. They want to engage. Um, we should allow them to do so and offer deeper interaction with our ads. Tabletize the experience. There was a lot of frustration when words like click were there or things that were shown that it was truly not meant for the tablet. No guessing games, having to make it very intuitive and simple. You know, the consumer, you would think they could, um, some things are very intuitive, but you have to make sure that the consumer is very clear on what those steps are going to go through. If they're going to click through, where is that going to take them? They hate being taken out of their app if they don't know that's what they're going to do. And speak to me. Contextual relevance was very, very important. Being very clear where your ad is going to be in the mindset that the consumer is in. So the winning models are these three. The banner to full page, pre-roll with overlay, and rich media interstitial. Now we understand these are not groundbreaking models, but they do one major thing that their benchmarks don't, which is add engagement and interactivity to these units. So what we found is, we, so we compared the banner to full page to a static banner, pre-roll with overlay to a regular pre-roll, and rich media interstitial to a regular um, interstitial. And the key thing that we found is that each of those models are not, cannot be flip-flopped with the different types of content. A consumer does not want to be reading a print article and then have a pre-roll pop-up. They find it very, very jarring. So um, we found that there's, we really, we realized we were studying three different types of content on the tablet, web, video, and print, and found these models working specifically for those types of content. I'm going to do very quick demos because I know we're, we're short on time here, but um, the banner to full page, as you can expect, is just a banner that can have animation, and when they click on it, it takes them to a full page experience. There's no reason to have them go to a landing page unless you're telling them to do something else, but it's really just this great interactive experience where they can accomplish a lot of things in that full page, and then there always should be a close button. The pre-roll with overlay. Um, so as you guys probably know, you can't autoplay on um, iOS devices, so they have the ability to customize that pre-roll experience. They love choosing different videos, um, getting coupons, learning more about different products, um, and also, again, not being taken away from their app or site. And then lastly, the rich media interstitial. This is a, this is a lower quality video because it was actually videotaped of someone's working on the tablet. So, but what you can see is that it really tablet has that experience. It was a full page asking the um, viewer to shake their tablet. I chose a scent for them and then gave them a coupon. So we tested these 54 different creative concepts and 74 different custom executions. We spent five, over $5 million in media and reached those 20 million different consumers. Insight Express was our uh, research partner, and we are now 75% of their uh, tablet norms. And what we learned is that all these models are more effective than their benchmarks. So the top five takeaways from this field trial was really that tablet ads work. Re uh, advertisers really need to have research behind things, right? Like, in, before we move millions of dollars, we need to know that this works. And this model, this uh, research really proved that it did. And if users engage, tablet ads work even better. People want interactive options, and these options create opportunities for advertisers. And education is key to success on this evolving platform. I'm going to touch really lightly on each of these points. So we have the research results behind every single one of these models that were tested. The check marks show when there is a, pos a significant lift between the uh, new models, the uh, interactive models, versus a static, the static um, benchmark models. What you can see is that for these attitudinal metrics, every single model um, has a check mark, and every, every single metric has a check mark across the different models. When we look at engagers, every single box has a check mark. And as we said, people want to engage. They want to, um, they want to really interact with the ads, and the numbers really prove that.
So this really creates opportunities for advertisers. We need to make sure that we are really taking advantage of that blank canvas that we have and look into the different metrics that come out there. We, we looked at behavioral metrics such as click-through rate, but engagement rate really is something that we think might be something you want to consider moving forward because all that interactivity that's happening within that rich media full page experience, that doesn't count as a click-through rate. We need to make sure we're looking at all those different interactions. And lastly, education being the key to success on this evolving platform. The image on the left shows what it's like to create one ad in a desktop environment. It works everywhere. If you want to create an ad in uh, the tablet environment, and we look at iOS versus Android versus app versus browser, you have a heck of a lot more work to do. And so we need to make sure that everybody's really educated, they know where their ad is running, that MRate is being implemented properly, and um, that's the only way that we're really going to make sure this can truly scale. So, I know we're running short on time. I just want to make sure, because um, how much time do we have left? We're going to shift to questions. Okay. So what I'll just say is we have best practices. All this is available. Go to the risingtidecoop.com slash research. We put together four large presentations that are um, gathering all of the industry studies that we could find that are public. Condense them all down into one page, quick facts. So all these are available right at this website. And then also we highly recommend you downloading our Tablet Lane app. Um, it has all of this research brought to life. Um, it, it not only goes into the results and um, best practices, but it also goes through things like we have some infographics about the day in the life of the tablet user, where we use our tablets, history of the tablet, and all that kind of stuff. So you can always reach out to us here too. Thank you. All right. So. Um, do you have a, a handheld mic? Yeah, right so if you guys just grab a chair there. So some really, hopefully, thought-provoking conversation and ideas here in this session. And in the moments that, that we have remaining, um, I'll, I'll uh, start with a couple of questions of my own, and then I'd love to open it up to the audience. But Andrew, just one question for you. Um, really interesting debate around apps versus the mobile web. You know, so apps by definition are a destination. If you look at the web evolution, it's not about destination anymore, it's about syndication. It's about this fragmentation. You talked about the attention span issue for an app, and I talked about the conversion. So apps versus mobile web, how, how do you think about that? It, it's very tricky. I mean, the one thing that apps have built into them that websites don't is there's a reminder system in the form of updates even, you know, there's also a reminder system in the form of badges, although, you know, most people tend to not turn on badges for most apps because they're a big pain in the neck. But, you know, the fact that you are reminded, hey, there's an update for this app, at least that is something that kind of, you know, jog your memory on it. So there is a system for it. And, I mean, I think the cream tends to rise to the top. But, you know, everybody installs, you know, uh, 20 plus apps, but people use a handful regularly, right? And, and, and the data on that is really clear. Um, I think that it really, really depends on what you want the consumer to do. Um, you know, I was talking to a CPG client, and they wanted, you know, they wanted an app, and for what they wanted, we said, you know, no one is ever going to install this app. Right? There's just no reason ever to do it. Um, whereas you can make a great, you know, mobile web or M dot site for them. So, I mean, it, I don't think there's a one size fits all. It's very much case by case. But you just have to look hard and not fall in love with, I want an app or I want responsive design. You have to say, this is what it needs to do. These are my goals. Yep. And I think it's, it's, it's amazing how rare that happens. Totally fair. And Beth, as, as you went through all of these, you know, more than 100 options in the, in the pool, did you feel like most of the options were inspired by creativity? or add effectiveness, or were they really balanced? What do you think, mo what, what was the original inspiration for, for the vast majority of those ideas? Um, that's an interesting question, actually. When I look back at the different ideas, it was very clear the ones that were just repurposing, um, this is what I've been doing online, or this is what I'm doing on a, a mobile phone, and let's just move it to tablet, versus ones that truly took advantage of the tablet. So as you'll see, the ones that made it through are the ones that were specific for that tablet environment. And you know, there, it was interesting. There was one model that was tested that um, when you rotated your tablet, the ad popped up and a different experience popped up. So that was purely tablet, but the consumer hated it because it, they lost control. 
So I think it's that whole balance of like we can have creativity, we can have some um, you know really great innovative things, but we have to think about what does a consumer want, what's going to provide value, because that intimate device of a tablet it needs to provide utility. Great. I think we have a question. Hi, yes, uh, Michael Singer with Tab Times. We cover tablets and business. Question for all three of you in uh, your perspectives on how um, the advertising groups um, can help the publishers. Uh, previous session talked a little bit about how hybrids seem to be the way to go for apps, not only for cost savings, but also because uh, they're technology Luddites uh, from the publishing world, apparently. So uh, they're curious on how. Uh, who's leading whom at this point? Uh, you know, how can you help publishers of not just regular content like the HuffPo, but also other publishers get up to speed? Will you only do uh, business with that, and what did you find? When you're talking about a hybrid, are you talking about a native HTML hybrid? Right. And so, I'm sorry, what's the question? So the question is, uh, who's leading whom at this point? I mean. Well, Coca-Cola only work with, say, the Financial Times, New York Times, Washington, uh, um, Wall Street Journal, because they have the, 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 the bankroll, basically, to get that great app experience on tablets. What's the, you know, and, and what is the opportunity then, I guess, for those who do not have deep pockets in the, in the publishing world? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that we really saw from the study um, is it, it casts a very strong light on the fact that there is no standardization right now in tablet advertising. Right? There is whatever the opposite of standardization is, total entropy. And I think that's a huge problem. Because yes, if you have deeper pockets, you can do custom advertising and, and you can make it work. And if you don't, you're kind of relegated to pretty poor experiences. So um, who's leading whom? I mean, I think, uh, I think what these guys are doing is a, is a great step, right? trying to put a stake in the ground and say this is something that actually works. The challenge is, how do you get the industry to say, we're all going to adopt a, um, you know, we're going to see the data, and we're all going to adopt the same way of doing things, um, as happened with IAB. Now, you can argue that there are some challenges with IAB, but, um, you know, standardization is what's going to, you know, leadership towards standardization, I think, is going to help a lot. So, I don't think that um, advertisers are just going to, like, the, the big name publishers. I think in the world that we are at right now, We'll take him, we meet with startups, we meet with companies that haven't even started yet. We have to. There's so many, the industry is moving so quickly that if we don't try and stay on top of anything that's out there, all the new technologies out there, it's not always going to come from, you know, New York Times or any, you know, big companies. It's, it's going to come from anywhere. In fact, it usually doesn't. Right. It usually comes from smaller, more nimble companies who are less stuck in their ways and don't have as much to lose. So we as advertisers need to have strong relationships with you know, various companies of various sizes in order to make sure we're making the best decisions for our clients. And um, I think that while I know the, uh, the models are not as groundbreaking as one would hope, but they are standards in the way, that, and that's the goal that we are trying to go for, is that when I want to be in a web environment, what should I do? When I want to do video ads, what do I do? Because unless an advertiser has those the clear direction and proven results, it's very hard to move those dollars. So our, what we tried to do is to say, here, if you want to run on this site or that site, here's what you can run, and we know that it works. And so it doesn't matter if it's you know, a site that no one's heard of or a site that everyone uses every day. Um, I think technology enables everybody to be on the same page. Yeah, I, I think the advertiser objectives are what are guiding who they go to and which publishers they're considering. And I would say we've got clients who are taking full advantage, for example, of our cross-platform roadblocking uh, technology and the ability to own all of our screens um, uh, across devices. And then there are others who just want to look at mobile or just want to look at display. It's about what they want to achieve. So. Um, I want to be respectful of time. Um, if, there's, uh, if there's one more quick question, we can take that, and then I think we're going to wrap up. Please, go ahead. Yeah, your hand was up. Oh, I'm sorry. It's um, in the middle of the room. There's a mic there. I apologize. We can repeat your question. Yeah, if you tell me, I'll state it. It seems like you know, some of the practices that you're showing, you're showing some best of practices which add the most engaging. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, maybe something on the back end, So 
So I think it's your question, what are the different KPIs that advertisers are going to apply with all these new models? Is that kind of what you're saying? I think that what we're seeing is that no one KPI fits uh, all advertisers. Every advertiser has to have their own different set of KPIs, and that's the only way to truly measure success across the different platforms. And um, otherwise, you're just testing things to test things, and you're never going to know how to move forward. So I think that it, it could be anything that you suggest. An advertiser could, has, it's not just awareness. It's not just click through. It's everything we can test. And I think that's the wonderful thing about technology and the space that we're in is that we can track all of that and, and really measure success in new ways. That's very, yeah, the question is how do we track it in the multi-screen world with, with cookies um, being uh, not available everywhere. That's something we're, we're studying. We, we don't have the answer yet, but we know that it's not, that it is a multi-screen world. We need to figure it out, especially with what HuffPo's doing. And, you know, it's, we need to figure out the viewership across screen and how to make sure we're making that a good experience. And I think that on the multi-screen uh, side of things, I think there'll be some workarounds that will evolve using so many of the applications and things that we're using do involve logins. And so even without that cookie data, there are other ways for us to extrapolate and sort of work around that to understand the dynamics from one screen to another as consumers log in from one device to the next. I think that understanding that login data will become more important than ever before. So we can really start to understand those dynamics um, in all of those different venues. Oh, we've got one more question in the back. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question with a sort of slightly British stroke European perspective, so um, indulge me. Um, there is a headlong rush to take uh, print titles that are currently in the offline world, so newspapers and magazines in particular, and go to PDF under glass. And print people want to do this primarily so they can stop printing stuff on paper and stop shipping it around as hard copy. From what you've said today, they need to therefore change their entire advertising model in title, which presents a significant barrier. What advice would you give to some of the big print barons that are out there that want to stop physically producing papers and turn to content providers? Do they have to completely re-engineer their business model, or would PDF under glass work going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I would start by saying, um, if, the, if you're thinking only about re-engineering the ad model, that's the problem from the beginning. T taking a print publication and moving it to, in your, I think, well-described PDF under glass, that's where you're gonna see a, a real miss because you're not utilizing the platform for what it does well. I think the first thing you have to do is um, change the content uh, and the way the content gets displayed so that it really suits the medium. And then, yeah, you also have to change your ad model. I think you guys are a great example of Huffington Post of doing just that and doing it really successfully. Yeah, I, I think it's about fundamentally reinventing that consumer experience. And you know, I think all the lessons learned from this session have been around starting with the consumer first and starting with those deep insights around what does or does not work for them and letting the business model follow. I think simply following a matching luggage strategy to the, to the more archaic models of consumption I think leaves a lot on the table. Um, I also think if you look at the core business model of print, if you look at things like ABC and how circulation is measured and readers per copy, the incremental, uh, during this transition, the incremental value of that viewer that's going to be on, uh, on these other devices relative to the core base of the business model, which is measured in traditional terms, it's just very hard to make the case that it's worth paying extra, in which case um, you're, you're not able to translate that into incremental advertising dollars. So it really does require complete reinvention. The amazing thing is most of those magazines, the leading ones, are extraordinary consumer brands, and it's that perspective that they need to embrace as opposed to simply transitioning to a different form factor. So with that, um, I believe we're out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining us, and uh, hopefully found the conversation fruitful. <laughs>